This, this um, silhouette that you can see right here at the Library Company of Philadelphia has been attributed to both Moses Williams and um, Charles Wilson Peel, as well as Raphael Peel. The um, attribution is still um, um, unclear. And so we um, generally cite either one or two or three individuals when talking about this um, profile. But as you can see, this is quite a sensitive silhouette. Um, there's incredible detail in the ribbon around um, the, the neck of uh, the necktie of this individual, the hair tie of this individual. You can even see the eyelash here, as well as some hair um, sticking out on top of the forehead. So this is the um, presentation of the silhouette show that was um, at the National Portrait Gallery in 2018. Um, it was a, his, a presentation in a corridor with four galleries that you see here, two on each side. And in the corridor, there were um, various historical silhouettes. And in the galleries that you can get a peek of one here were the contemporary artists. And what we had decided to do was to create this kind of passage, this journey through the historical development of silhouettes by um, looking not just at <clears throat> the National Portrait Gallery's holdings, which you see here and here, but also as such things um, as um, the ways that silhouettes were used in the decorative arts, such as on these teacups here that we borrowed um, from the New York Historical Society. And you can get a, a better look here. And I'll be talking about this portrait in a moment as well. What I very much want to emphasize to all um, of us tonight is the ways in which silhouettes democratized portraiture. And by that, I mean that we all know that photography democratized portraiture. It allowed, it allowed um, citizens to be, um, to be able to get a, um, obtain a likeness of themselves that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to have procured. At this point, we're talking in the early 1800s, a portrait would usually be painted in oil. It would cost about $25. It was available for the upper middle class or those who were in a, um, in a well-to-do family. And um, the camera, which was um, part of the, um, a number of developments both in France and the United States, um, the result of a number of technological innovations. Photography came out, um, was you know, debuted in 1839, and that truly um, allowed individuals to picture themselves um, as it continued to gain a more popular, um, a more popular technology that became much more accessible in the 1850s and 60s. But before the camera, but before the, but before photography, what I wanted to emphasize to you all is that we had silhouettes, which were just um, made with cut paper, um, scissors, obviously, and maybe some ink. And what I wanted to show here is this lovely um, double portrait um, from um, Vermont, from the Sheldon um, galleries, where there is a same-sex couple um, it's from the Henry Sheldon Museum of Vermont History, and the couple depicted here is um, Sylvia Drake and Charity Bryant, who met in Vermont in 1807. They started a tailoring business. They were lifelong residents of Weybridge. They were Congregationalist churchgoers, and um, William Cullen Bryant was the nephew of Charity Bryant. And he described their relationship in this way. If I were permitted to draw aside the veil of private life, I would tell you how they took each other as companions for life and how this union no less sacred to them than the tie of marriage has subsisted in uninterrupted harmony for more than 40 years. And so um, they were buried next to each other in Vermont. And this portrait, this double portrait is from circa 1805 to 1815. Um, you can see that it has um, a heart tied here. This material here is in fact human hair. And I included this uh, double portrait in the exhibition to again emphasize the ways in which individuals who normally would never have gotten their likeness made in oil paint found a way to have their portraits captured through the means of the silhouette. 
And another object that I think is absolutely interesting that is actually from our collection is this album that you're seeing um, by William Henry Bache. And William Henry Bache was um, a silhouette cutter who was an itinerant like many, like many other silhouette cutters um, working in early America. And this this silhouette album is um, part of the National, National Portrait Gallery's holdings. It is an extraordinary treasure. It has thousands of silhouettes in it. It includes um, presidents, including um, George Washington and Martha Washington, and many sitters from, um, from pretty much Portland, Maine to New Orleans, Louisiana. And here's another view of it. Um, William Bache would make, um, make his silhouettes give to the uh, to the sitter one of the silhouettes or two of the silhouettes and then paste in the remaining silhouette into this album. And so it's an extraordinary record circa 1803 to 1809 that the National Portrait Gallery has in its collection. There's about 1846 portraits in this um, album. Um, Beige primarily operated in New Orleans on Royal Street and he depicted anyone who would be willing to pay 25 cents for four silhouettes. And for an additional 25 cents, he would um, add additional shading. And then for $2, he would be painting an additional $2, he would actually create a portrait with colors in a miniature style. And so silhouettes and miniature, um, miniature portraits were in the same category of decorative arts and crafts. Um, but as you can see, um, silhouettes really um, took off in a, in, a, in a different way than miniature portraits. So I wanted to dig a little deeper into this idea of why, why silhouettes were able to, um, why it was a medium that was able to capture those who had previously not had their likeness captured before. And I think as many of us can surmise, it was the simplicity of the means of creating a portrait, which was um, you didn't have to be a skilled painter. You didn't have to understand the ways in which um, color and shadow and the paintbrush work together um, with the you know, skillful movement of the hand and an understanding of the way that light um, um, shows on a person's face and capturing that in paint. You didn't have to have that kind of expertise as a silhouette cutter. You simply had to have a piece of paper, you had to have an excellent eye, and you had to have excellent scissors. Um, so yes, there is the simplicity of the medium, which is why they was able to capture the likeness of so many, but it was also the fact that it was a very portable means. Um, you didn't have to cut, cart around a number of oil paints. Um, you could carry you know, very light things. Um, the, the, the paper that you had to carry was very light. And I also know that in this example that you see here, which is identified merely by the name Flora, as you can see here, it says Flora's profile, which is one of the earliest known depictions of an enslaved person. Um, this is at the Stratford Historical Society in Stratford, Connecticut. And what I know about um, this image, which has so many questions around it, is that this was um, made in conjunction with a bill of sale for this individual, for this enslaved individual, which you see here. And this bill of sale is dated December 13th, 1796. And again, this entire object is at the Stratford Historical Society and it was featured in the exhibition. And it gives a glimpse into the slave trade, also the ways in which the Northern states were entangled in the peculiar institution, if you will, of slavery. Um, and it describes um, a certain Negro wench named Flora, I'm quoting here from the bill of sale, um, who was sold from Margaret Dwight to Asa Benjamin, um, who lived from 1763 to 1833 for, 30, for 25 pounds sterling. The remaining documentation of this individual is thin, um, but we were able to locate a ledger in um, Stratford, Connecticut, and an 1800, um, a census from the year 1800 that cites a servant living in the Benjamin household. There is also a family ledger that shows the death of a woman named Flora on August 31st, 1815. So this um, silhouette, it's haunting. It appears to be life-size. It appears to be drawn 
um, from um, candlelight. Um, and I would say that this is an individual whose hair can be seen um, in some, in some uh, incredible detail, as well as um, some features that we would normally um, not have seen in, in an individual um, who would have their portrait made at this time, meaning an individual who appears to have um, a prominent brow, a flattened nose, and um, the words Flora's profile written underneath. And so we move from this um, portrait, which um, you see here being um, described by um, associate professor at University of Pennsylvania, Gwendolyn Dubois Shaw. We move here to Moses Williams, who I know is um, featured in, your, um, in the exhibition at the Trout Gallery. And so this image is the only known likeness of Moses Williams. And I wanted to take a few minutes just to talk about him. He um, was, um, the son of mixed race parents, Lucy and Scarborough Williams, um, and they were enslaved individuals who were owned by Charles Wilson Peel. And after Peel manumitted and manumitted the couple in 1786, he um, he had uh, Moses Williams in in um, still with him, who was only nine years old at the time. And so Moses Williams grew up with the Peel family. And um, Peel, in limited ways, treated Moses like a son. He trained him in taxidermy museum display, and he also traded, trained him in the physiognotrace. So when he was, when Moses was about 28 in 1802, he was manumitted. And um, you can see here that he is dressed quite finely. He has some anglicized features. Um, and as I discussed earlier, the attribution of Moses was questioned um, in terms of whether this is in fact a self-portrait. But what you see here um, is an individual who was able to actually have a life, a career as an artist. Um, and I wanted to just give you a few more details before moving on about Moses Williams. Um, he cut more than 8,000 profiles at Charles Wilson Peel's museum in Philadelphia. He became so renowned for creating silhouettes that he made even a likeness of Peel, his one-time owner, and a Peel's second and third wives, as well as four of the Peel children in the early 1800s. And because he was receiving a six cent commission, um, later eight cents for each silhouette he made, he made a sizable income. Um, with that financial security, he was able to marry the Peel family cook, Maria, who was white. They had a daughter and he bought a two-story brick home brick home, excuse me, from 1813 on in the Philadelphia City Directory, Moses Williams is listed as a profile cutter. And you can see that also being referenced here as the cutter of profiles. And he had a plus sign by his name to indicate that he was a person of color. So um, we move into the ways in which Moses Williams was not only cutting portraits of um, the white patrons of um, the Peel Museum, but also cutting portraits um, or working with Charles Wilson Peel, as you see in this attribution, in making portraits of natives um, and um, the indigenous population who were meeting with Thomas Jefferson, president at the time, um, around um, 1804 and 1805 in a number of meetings called um, the Native American delegation visits um, to Thomas Jefferson. And one wonders how um, Moses would have um, considered his position being a manumitted slave, cutting the portraits of Native Americans who were meeting with then the president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, to discuss their future and their rights um, to the land um, and uh, the ways in which they could think of freedom. I wanted to move on um, from the discussions of Moses Williams and um, William Bache and this idea of democratizing portraiture um, to very, very quickly talk to you about probably the most well-known silhouette cutter and that is Auguste Edouard. And here you see two works from the National Portrait Gallery's collection. Um, the one on the left is of former president John Quincy Adams. This was uh, made in 1841. And the one on the right is from 1842 of the, the um, handicapped blind um, Laura Bridgman, 
who was um, an important advocate for disabilities rights and um, had um, been so persuasive and um, arresting in her in her writing and her work that such folks as Charles Dickens wrote about her. And so why I put these two images together is to show you again the ways that folks from different paths, from different walks of life, um, were captured in the same way. So you have a very uniform aesthetic here. You have the profile cut um, in black set against a lighter background. And in some ways, many, many um, individuals, no matter their background, began to have a uniform appearance. And so usually August Edward, who would um, be um, asking his, his portrait um, sitters to stay still for a few uh, moments, would cut these portraits, paste them into these um, pre-made lithographic backgrounds that you see here, and, um, and then um, you know, uh, get, uh, have a, a transaction, a financial transaction, where he would give one of the portraits to the sitter and then keep the other for himself. This is another interesting image um, by August Edouard. So August Edouard came from France. He um, came by ship, obviously, to the United States to basically make a living as a portrait cutter. And even though he was not um, Black, he was able to picture those who were Black, who were, um, so to speak, invisible and on the margins. And this is one exquisite silhouette that he made that's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was made around 1844. And um, what it says at the bottom there in this um, lovely handwriting are, are the unfortunate word slave belonging to Mrs. Oily. There's no name. And, and as many of us know, um, enslaved individuals would frequently take on the name of the folks who own them as chattel, as property. You can see in this image, we have one foot peeking out. We can see that she has a dignified um, posture and a, a, a refined updo, and that she's wearing a ruffled collar as well as a full petticoat. And um, she has a, a noble carriage. On the back of the silhouette is written New Orleans, 1st of March, 1844, and again, belonging to Miss Oily. What we do know about um, the Oily family in um, New Orleans is that there was a Mr. and Mrs. Chase Oily. And um, we also know that Edward cut a silhouette of both Mr. and Mrs. Chase Oily um, in a five day period around this time. But I show you this portrait again to emphasize that here's an enslaved individual who would not have their likeness made in an oil painting, but was captured in silhouette. And even though we know nothing about this individual in terms of their biography, um, and in fact of their, their real name, we do have this likeness. And um, I think it's also interesting to think about the ways in which the country at the time was wrestling with so many issues around slavery. Um, the Civil War was yet to unfold and unfurl, as we know. But many individuals in the nation were seeking out silhouettes that would be made of them that were made in Black. Um, and so I wanted to just explore for a second how silhouettes were used as a form of communication to talk about slavery. And this is an incredibly um, important work in the history of abolitionism. It was made in Liverpool in um, 1788 by an abolitionist who wanted to demonstrate um, in a clear, simple language, the slave trade and the number of individuals that would be stowed on a boat. So this famous print, um, many um, institutions have a version of this. Um, this one is from the Library of Cong Congress. It's titled The Stowage of the British Slave Ship Brooks. And it's showing, in fact, the number of individuals who would be on, um, who would be stowed and the ways in which they would be stowed on a double-decker ship. And you can see here a cross-section of the bodies, another cross-section, and then a bird's eye view of the number of bodies, which would be somewhere between three to 400 um, Africans that would be taken from the continent and um, um, put on a ship across the Atlantic to be sold. 
Another important um, discussion of um, silhouettes and blackness, I think, is to consider the Amistad case, um, which many of you know about, but I will just describe very briefly. Um, a, a, a ship containing enslaved individuals was taken, um, was on its way to Cuba and ended up having a mutiny on, and the enslaved individuals on the ship eventually ended up um, near New York on Long Island. And um, due to a number of government and diplomatic interventions, the enslaved individuals were then imprisoned in New Haven while they awaited trial and their future. And while they were in um, New Haven, they were, um, there was an interpreter, there was a silhouette cutter who went to speak to each of these individuals. And this um, book was created, A History of the Amistad Captives. And again, their portraits were not made in a typical drawing or a typical um, um, straightforward way. Instead, their portraits were made in silhouette. And so you can see here for number 27, Fabana, large round head tattooed on the breast in middle life. He and Grabo were from the same country, both having the same king. He has two wives and one child, all lived in one house. His village was surrounded by soldiers. He was taken prisoner, sold twice, the last time to a Spaniard at Lomboco. So I wanted to emphasize again the ways in which silhouette, the form, though it deleted details, it deleted all of the interior aspects of, of a person's likeness because it merely captured the profile. What ended up happening is with the addition of text, um, such as what we see here, or with the addition of careful documentation um, in the ways that middle-class families would paste silhouettes into albums and make sure that they were passed on for generations to come. Silhouettes do have an important aspect of portraiture, which is a memorialization and a remembrance. So I'm going to turn um, now away from the historical discussion um, in very quickly, um, as I know we wanted to have time for questions, to talk about um, the contemporary artists whom I featured in the exhibition um, in 2018, but really focusing on um, Kara Walker's work um, to make sure that I um, touch on some of the important issues that are being presented at the Trout Gallery um, that you folks may have been considering. So as I mentioned, there were four contemporary artists and each of the four galleries was devoted to the work of one living woman artist in the silhouette show in Blackout. And um, I was pleased that they were all living women artists. I wanted to just give you an overview of the other three besides Kara Walker. The first was Kumi Yumashita and Kumi Yumashita um, was um, born and educated in Japan and came here to the United States. This is her here. And she uses um, the silhouette um, to probe uh, issues that relate to identity, um, humanity, and um, the metaphysical. And the ways that she does that is she takes a single light source, which um, in this case was placed um, somewhere over here. And from that single light source, she will use objects that she creates, such as these wood, wood letters that she herself created and place them in such a way that they create a silhouette. And so this work is probing how the thoughts in one's mind, um, the various numbers, the various data that we keep in our heads, the various passwords, the phone numbers, the addresses, all of these things um, that we have in, in, our, in our psychic state, so to speak, can contribute to one's identity. And you'll see in this remarkable image how she has created a portrait from the ways that the light is reflecting off of the edges of these letters. In this work, she's actually taken origami square sheets of paper and shaped the edges um, on one side, again, with a single light source that's usually right here to create exact likenesses of individuals. Um, um, exact profile likenesses. And this is in fact my silhouette right here in the black. And here's a self-portrait of Kumi Yamashita. Um, again, there is the light source. And this is a wood, piece of wood 
in which she has carved out her silhouette on the side edge, just on the edge here. And when the light reflects, it creates the illusion of her sitting on the chair. The second artist that I wanted to talk about was Christy Malakoff, who comes um, from Canada, is currently based in Russia, and she created a silhouette that um, was, in fact, um, over 20 individuals who were dancing around a maypole, 20 children, and she cut this out of black paper. You can see the incredible detail she made um, out of for each individual um, who is dancing around the maypole. This was over 20 feet high. Um, it's sculptural, it's taking silhouettes into the form of three dimensions. And um, again, it's questioning the idea of memory and um, also the sense of playfulness that silhouettes suggest in terms of shadow. The third artist is Camille Uderbach, who is currently based um, in California, a Stanford art professor, and somebody who uses the idea of silhouettes um, in terms of digital um, imaging and technology. So a camera in, in this work of, that was in the show, a camera would be placed above here and a person's movement would be captured. Their silhouette would be captured from a bird's eye view in terms of pushing around paint um, and other organic shapes that were digitally created. But of course, the most famous uh, contemporary artist working in silhouettes is um, Kara Walker. And I just wanted to close by talking about some of the ideas that Kara Walker explores um, in her silhouettes. Um, a couple of statements that I found very in interesting um, that you um, can consider as we start to look through these images. The first was that she was interested in the paradox of removing a form from a blank surface that in turn creates a black hole. She explains further, I was struck by the irony of so many of my concerns being addressed blank versus black, whole, H-O-L-E, versus whole, W-H-O-L-E, shadow versus substance, etc. There's also the great quote from Sojourner Truth, quote, I sell the shadow to support the substance. And so what Walker um, also said in another interesting statement was, from a sort of pol polite middle-class society emerge silhouettes. And it's not as haughty or aristocratic as a full-fledged oil painting portrait. Everyone could get one for a few pennies and you had an image, you had a connection with physiognomy. And of course I didn't talk about um, physiognomy or the, the discourse of phrenology that was so um, rampant um, in the early 1800s, um, uh, but it was an uh, important quasi-scientific um, way of identifying someone's personality and intelligence by looking at the shape of their head and um, their profile. So what Kara does here, what Kara Walker does here is that she takes this very simplified, almost um, um, comedic-like form. And um, she was very drawn to comic books, Mickey Mouse cartoons when she was young. Um, and she, starts to explore antebellum uh, black life on a plantation in her silhouette forms. So the work you see here is entitled Auntie Walker's Wall Sampler for Civilians. And it's from 2013. And this wall um, space is approximately, gosh, 23 feet by 11 feet high. And you can see here there's disembodied heads, there's, um, uh, 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 an, a seemingly African looking person. You can tell from the hair being thrown wildly from a horse. There's a woman who appears to be white in a plantation in, um, I'm sorry, in a costume that would befit somebody who was the mistress of a plant state plantation holding a head. There's um, an African hunched over lancing a sword um, through a soldier. So there's many acts of horrifying violence. And what Kara Walker has explained is that she, she sought to use this incredibly opaque um, medium, this opaque genre of silhouettes to explore such complex and um, weighted issues as racism and the history of slavery in America. Another image that 
um, she worked on that was a companion to that is um, another wall sampler, but this one is called the wall sampler, Auntie Walker's wall sampler for savages. And in this, in this vignette, you're seeing inequities of power between master and slave, but seemingly from um, the point of view of an African village, you have this individual dressed in seemingly grass-like garb um, and wearing a hat that resembles a tiki hut, carrying a sphere. And you have individuals holding other forms of weapons and committing great acts <coughs> of brutality. I'm going to end there and take questions as I, my voice is going out on me, I apologize. Asma, thank you so, so much. That was incredible. Um, all right, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand um, using the raise hand function, or you can put your question in the chat and I can read them off, whichever one you're more comfortable with. Awesome, Lisa, I'll start with you. You can go ahead and unmute. I am just wondering about uh, whether women were told to wear their hair a certain way or wear certain clothing that would look pronounced in the ultimate silhouette or whether artists actually enhanced certain regions? Was, was, there, was there some sort of desire for a certain profile that they may have uh, changed when, in the process of cutting the silhouette or was it just strictly objective? Thank you for that question, Lisa. I think that it would depend um, obviously on the sitter and the cutter um, in terms of what they were specifically looking for. But in terms of somebody from my position looking at silhouettes from um, this, this point of view, um, you know, in the 21st century, it seems that there was a preference to have women's hair pulled back so that their features could be more discernible. And the clothing, no matter how um, how um, complex it was in structure was usually simplified um, I, so that there was an ease in um, depicting it. And I will also say that this is an interesting note. Sometimes August, someone like August Edouard would take white chalk and draw details of clothing onto the black paper um, that would um, give more information about one's clothing and dress. Sarah, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Sorry, I need to unmute. Um, I really enjoyed your lecture. I, I never really thought about silhouettes in this way. So this is really interesting, but I was interested in the book of silhouettes that you were showing us with the miniatures. Mm -hmm. Are those individuals identified in the book? They are, they are, Sarah. It's actually a lovely thing to see because in the beginning portions of the silhouette um, ledger are all of the cut faces. And then in the back is an actual ledger that's recording the names matching number by number. Okay, wonderful. It was hard to see in, in the image that you had, um, but the fact that you, you were, were able to identify some of them, I assumed that they were identified in some way. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions Anything in the chat? I do have one question here um, to follow up on that. Are the order of those silhouettes, is it just the order in which they were commissioned? Do we know? We don't know. I will say that the first two silhouettes are of George and Martha Washington. Okay. So, <laughs> There does seem to be a logic here that may not just be in terms of um, sequence of when they were made. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry, I forget where the hand function is. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, I'm kind of curious what the relationship was between um, Peel and Williams was, I mean, 
Williams was definitely his slave, but was he treated really well or um, are people, is the jury out on that? Um, we do have some primary sources discussing the ways in which uh, Moses was regarded by Peels' natural sons. Um, there were um, particularly Raphael and Rubens Peel. Um, may, they may have been envious um, of the relationship that Charles Wilson Peel had um, with Moses Williams. And I don't have the direct source right here, but I do know that I recall reading it and I wrote about it in my exhibition catalog. Um, and Moses's proficiency at silhouettes was um, something that Peel was so proud of that he manumitted the, um, the young man before, before his 28th birthday. Um, I, I think that was an important fact that I may not have made clear when I was talking about Moses's manumission that um, Charles Wilson Peel did release him early because he was so pleased with his performance. <clears throat> did he continue to work with Peel or for Peel or did he go out on his own then? I, I, would, I would probably defer to Gwendolyn Dubois-Shaw who's written so much about Moses Williams, but I would, um, my understanding is that the silhouettes that he cut um, that gave him this you know, salary were done on the premises of the Peel Museum, that he relied on that foot traffic. Thank you. <laughs> to, to follow on Melissa's question, uh, going more into the psychology of, of the interaction here, what is, and I don't have their dates in front of me, how does Moses' age line up with the fairly large number of children that Peel had, hmm. roughly speaking? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't, I can't recall specifically, and I'm not seeing the um, dates of um, Raphael, who was <clears throat> probably the main competitor uh, with Moses Williams in terms sure. of silhouette cutting. Um, but I do know that they were traveling, you know, that Raphael was traveling the country around precisely the same time that Moses was cutting the silhouettes in Peel's museum. But I, I don't have the precise age. Oh, that, uh, that's, yeah. dates. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Um, I had a question about kind of the stylization of the silhouettes. The ones that you shared from Auguste Edwards were so beautiful and I'd never seen silhouettes quite like that before. Would you say that there are different kind of fads that went in and out when it came to silhouette making, or was it more based on kind of the individual artists and what they were willing to kind of do with the medium itself? I think it would be both. It's a great question, Bianca. And I think that, you know, there are um, individuals um, such as Ann Verplank, who's a professor. Um, yes, <laughs> um, many, many of us um, admire Ann's um, scholarship on silhouettes, but but Anne Verplank, who's a, um, um, probably one of the most renowned silhouette um, experts, can look at a silhouette and identify usually um, who made the silhouette, not just in terms of the ways in which um, the edges are cut, but in terms of the details that were added in, such as you know the white chalk that I was talking about with August Edouard, or the ways in which the works um, would be either made out of white paper and put have the silhouette cut out from the middle of the paper and then put against a black background or how they were um, those were called hollow cuts or how they were made from black paper and then put against white background as well as the ways in which they related to their background um, so you have someone like august edward creating these lithographic um, backgrounds that you can see repeat um, throughout his silhouettes um, that were quite refined um, and um, were made by a Scotsman um, that he brought over from um, um, his time in Europe. And you also have the more plain backgrounds that you see in somebody like Moses. So I think from that, you can start to discern a certain kind of style and preference. Thank you. Sure. I have one question to, fall, to kind of uh, come up on uh, Kara Walker's work. Is it your sense, and this is more speculative, or if you've spoken to her directly, uh, her 
current work has been three-dimensional. She's been working, of course, the, the big project out at Brooklyn with the sugar Domino Sugar Factory, and then the uh, more recent work at the uh, Turbine Hall at the Tate, which is also sculptural. Do you see or do you sense or have you heard that where do silhouettes figure into her career path now? I think they remain um, a central aspect of her making in terms of the various issues they are pressuring, which is the idea of detail versus um, versus kind of a, a generality and um, flatness versus three-dimensionality and the ways in which um, a certain kind of, not irony, it's not the right word, but a certain kind of sarcasm or th this kind of dark humor um, that silhouettes elicit. Um, she's continuing to explore that in, in that, uh, that uh, monumental um, negress that was at the Domino Sugar Factory and in her tape um, turbine work. But I will say, Phil, that she is um, going into extraordinary new directions with drawing and watercolor. Um, oh, yeah. She, yeah, she's created a number of um, portraits of um, former President Obama, um, President, uh, former President Donald Trump, and, and the various issues around race that are um, fairly large scale, um, sweeping watercolor, charcoal, graphite um, imaging that um, really moves away from silhouettes wholesale. Interesting, thank you. Any other questions? I'm gonna scroll through here a little bit. I'm not seeing any at the moment. If anything comes up, you can uh, raise your hand. I'm just gonna offer a few quick announcements about the Trout Gallery. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that we are open until December 22nd, and then the Trout Gallery is closing for the holiday season, and we will reopen on January 4th. This is our final event of the semester, but if we have any students here this evening, we do have Trout Study Days at the Trout Gallery starting tomorrow and then moving through Monday the 13th and our hours are 10 to four. Um, don't forget that the Trout Gallery is always free and open to the public. We're open 10 to four and uh, Monday through Saturday. And then we are open until 8 p.m. late night on Thursday. So um, definitely stop by. Um, if there are no further questions, um, thank you so much, Asma, for being here with us this evening. That was so wonderful. Um, we really appreciate you. And uh, this is just a wonderful way to end the semester. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be talking about this incredible body of work and um, to have your kind uh, attention on this very chilly and dark night. Um, I wish you all a lovely December, a happy um, new year, and um, everyone be safe. Thank you.